thanks Dave and thanks to the organizers for putting together this workshop and for having me uh, here. Thanks also to all of you for sticking 11 talks already on conceptual engineering to, to go. That's impressive. <laughs> so large, probably more than I, anyone wanted. Uh, <laughs> except for your own talk somehow, which had to be there. Uh, so what I want to do today is uh, uh, describe to you my own view on uh, conceptual engineering and how it should be done and try to defend it very briefly against uh, some, some objections. Uh, some of you may know, but I found out I was shocked yesterday at dinner that some of you haven't read that book. <laughs> <laughs> My heart stopped beating. <laughs> uh, anyway, a year ago I published that book. I highly recommend it, if only for the <laughs> cover. It's great on your coffee table. Uh, it's a beautiful picture. Anyway, uh, uh, so I published that book about a year ago, and one of the main claims of the book is that the main method for gaining knowledge about what's necessary and what's possible is flawed, and uh, the philosophical issues that turn on such knowledge can just not be solved. And when I give that talk, usually sometimes there's someone with a tie in the audience. I identify him or her as a dean or as a provost, and then I say, is it the end of philosophy? And, I, and the dean already starts close, close philosophy department. <laughs> and I say, no, 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 of course, there are plenty of things philosophers can do, even if it turns out that some of the philosophical issues that require the type of modal knowledge that I don't think we can get, even if there's a lot of things to be done for, for a philosopher, that things that are left. And here is just a list. Many of the uh, philosophical issues that require the type of modal knowledge that, on my view, we can't get have more than a modest counterpart. Uh, so it's easy to translate some of these issues in a way that does not require uh, metaphysical knowledge. Furthermore, we can engage in non-ideal philosophies. There's this project of rational reconstruction, a la Reichenbach, if you're a philosopher of, of science. And there's uh, uh, the project of conceptual analysis and conceptual explication, which I described at uh, great length in the last chapter of, of my book. And I don't talk about it, but of course, critical theory here, among others, should be added to the list of activities in philosophies that just don't require any uh, a problematic modal knowledge. So what I want to do today is just talk about one of these activities that uh, uh, philosophers could still engage in if uh, uh, I were right. Uh, more precisely, the goal today is to make explicit what I take concepts to be. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about concepts and some of us during these last two days, I've actually said a few things about what their tech concepts to be. Some of the things I've said are quite congenial to my own way of thinking about concepts, including what was said in the last talk. Um, but I really want to be super clear about what I mean by concepts. Now, one of the bad things when you try to be super clear about what you mean by something is that everybody, everybody hates you. Uh, you're, you're, like, you're like super explicit and just people are like, that's just wrong. That's just not, not, not the way you should just talk about concepts. So uh, we give you plenty of reason to hate me uh, 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 by the end of the talk. Anyway, once I've spelled out what I mean by concept, then I will explain to you what I mean by conceptual engineering, which is just uh, 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 changing what I mean by, by concept. And then if I have time, I respond to a few objections, mostly coming from the right corner of the room. Uh, Herman has written a, a very nice uh, discussion of, uh, of my book, which uh, I guess in some form or other will come in field studies at, at some point. And I, I'll just uh, 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 address a few objections he makes in this uh, review or in this discussion. Okay, here's the structure of the talk. I'll start by explaining what I mean by concepts and the way I think about them. Then I'll move to conceptual engineering. Uh, in line with my previous, uh, in, with my book, I talk more often of conceptual uh, explication following Carnap. But I, I take the two to be really tightly connected, if, if maybe, maybe even identical. Uh, and so we haven't talked very much about that in this conference. And then I'll defend a little bit my view of conceptual engineering. So let's start by concepts. So do, I, do I take concepts to be? I think with many people I take a concept of X to be a type of psychological entity. So each concept token is a psychological entity. The concept itself is a type of psychological entity. That in itself should not be problematic for most of us. I think most of us are used to think about concepts uh, this way, as this way. 
Um, so that's actually probably the last slide where most of you are going to agree. Uh, <laughs> once we've uh, 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 said that, the next question is, okay, what is constitutive of these uh, psychological entities? And my way, anyway, of thinking about this question is what I call the delineation problem. So we uh, have a lot of beliefs about a given entity, a given class, a given substance, or belief-like states, you know, belief and or states which are like beliefs in various ways. I will just, uh, 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 after we're in a conference on conceptual engineering, we can, we're free to coin words. So I'm going to say belief, right, uh, uh, following uh, uh, a leaf. Uh, so they're belief or belief-like states. Uh, and the, the, the question is, we, we got all this belief, and which of them are constitutive of our concept of X? That's the way I like to think about uh, the problem. So we know we have a lot of beliefs about dogs. Some of them are true. Some of them are, are false. That's only a subset of uh, the very large set of beliefs about dogs. Each of these beliefs is connected with further beliefs about other things. And the task is to identify which of those is constitutive of the concept of dog and which of those are not. So far, just my background knowledge, or my background, what I call background knowledge, forget about the word knowledge, my background beliefs about, 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 about dog. How do we draw this partition here in my uh, set of beliefs? That's what I call the delineation problem. And as you may know, if you know a bit of uh, 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 philosophy of concept over the last 30 years, you've got a range of options. From atomists who just said, what's well, very simple, none of them matters to having a concept. To holists who say, well, it's very simple, all of them matters to having a concept. To people in the middle, like me, who are molecularists, who say, look, some of them matter for having a concept. But the question then is, which one? How do I identify those that are constitutive for having uh, a concept? All right, I think some of you may already be already a bit you know, disagreeing with me about the way, the very way of setting the problem. But here's I think, where most of you are going to uh, disagree. So how do I solve the delineation problem? What's my answer to the delineation problem? What I give you is a psychological answer. What I think distinguishes the belief or the beliefs that are constitutive of, the con of, of a given concept from those that are not is a psychological property. Uh, uh, the uh, beliefs that are constitutive are, as I said, retrieved by default. We access them uh, by default. And I will explain what I mean by by default in a sec. Uh, all the other ones are retrieved in a contextual manner. They are retrieved in some context, but not others. So let me just tell you what I mean by uh, by, by default. A body of beliefs, it should be an a L and not an R, about X is retrieved by default from memory if and only if when I think about X it is retrieved first and most important in a context insensitive manner. Because it is retrieved in a context insensitive manner, it does not require any cognitive resources to deploy it. You always deploy it. You don't have to think about when to deploy it. So its deployment can be automatic. And because it's automatic, it can be fast, right? So the crucial property is context independent. That's what's characterized um, um, uh, uh, um, by default uh, belief. And so in every context, that's going to be the type of expectations you have, either about a group of, of, of objects, a kind, or the expectation that you have about substances, about even substance, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, uh, bodies of information that are not belief tend to be uh, are retrieved in a context uh, dependent manner. So it's important uh, in the present context, particularly when you talk to philosophers, to make it clear what by default belief, what they're not, or what they're not exclusively. It's important to keep to, not to identify these bodies, these beliefs that we retrieve by default with belief about superficial properties of kind. But some of these uh, pieces of information that we retrieve may be about the superficial properties of kind. So for example, the color of dogs, or uh, you know, the, you know, the taste of water, for example. <coughs> but they need not be. They can be about the molecular structure, for example, of, the, of a substance. They can be about the function of an artifact. They can be about relational properties of, of various kind of matters, right? So there's no uh, connections between what's constitutive of a concept uh, if you use the property of being accessed by default and a certain form of superficiality uh, uh, for, for, uh, for the kind members or the uh, samples of a given substance. Now, uh, so that's, that's what I mean. Uh, so that's the type of tools I use to solve the delineation problem. Now, 
I'm making here an object called claim. I'm making a claim that if you look in memory, you find a distinction between two types of access to memory. Some information about a class or about a substance is contextual, some is acontext, acontextual, context insensitive. And there's a claim about the structure of our memory, of how we access lexical items, for example. Now, I don't have the time, and I'm not sure all of you are as interested by uh, the details of objective psychology as I am, so I won't uh, 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 put you to sleep with dozens of experiments. But if you're really interested by the empirical basis for the claim that this distinction, by default versus not by default, captures something important about memory, here's a chapter where I review uh, the, uh, the, relevant, the relevant evidence. What I want to, to say in the remainder of this section is to make a few comments about this notion of, of by default. And the first thing I need to do is to uh, contrast my answer to the delineation problem with the most common answers that philosophers would be giving to the same problem. When philosophers try to identify which belief or which beliefs are constitutive of a given concept, they either give, they either give a semantic answer or an epistemological answer. A semantic answer will have the following shape. The beliefs or the beliefs that are constitutive of a concept are analytically true, right? are those that are analytically true. Or the epistemic answer will have the following structure. There are those that are, known, that are known or justified a priori, right? So you could use this, uh, uh, um, uh, and, uh, this um, semantic notion and this epistemic notion, epistemological notion, to answer the delineation problem, right? And my answer to the delineation problem in psychological terms contrasts with these more common ways of uh, answering what beliefs, of finding out what beliefs are constitutive of, of concept. So why do I go the way I want to go? Well, for a number of, of reasons, one of them is that, like many philosophers, I'm skeptical of some of these notions. I'm skeptical of the distinction between analytic truths and non-analytic truths, synthetic <coughs> truths. So that's not the kind of tool I can uh, actually put to use to solve the delineation problem. I'm not skeptical of authenticity. I just don't understand it. So I'm not exactly sure exactly where it comes from. You know, it's just, I just don't understand what it is. Uh, so I, I'm not going to put it to use either to solve the delineation problem. So that's one type of reason. Another kind of reason is, uh, at least for many projects, this seems to be the wrong tools to solve the delineation problem. Let's suppose you do history of science, for example, and you're really interested in uh, some scientific concepts in the 17th century, concepts of heat, for example, uh, uh, when you start uh, working on the invention of uh, uh, temperature, like has a chain. I think it would be a mistake to uh, uh, identify what's constitutive of the concept of heat or of temperature in the 17th century using notions such as analytic truth. What was constitutive of people's beliefs at the time were plenty of false beliefs. Beliefs we know are false, right? A falsehood, it can be analytically true. Uh, and also, what was constitutive of people's belief, of people's belief for temperature at the time, were things that were a priori justified if they were justified at all. So a falsehood, they can be a, uh, a posteriori justified if they're justified at all. So a falsehood, they can be a priori justified. So for many projects, uh, the notion of um, analyticity and the notion of factory justification won't be very useful to solve the delineation problem. By contrast, I think for at least some projects, and I'm not saying for all projects, but for some projects, that notion will be useful. And I think it's going to be useful for the project of conceptual engineering. Right? So my answer is a psychological answer. It contrasts with the usual answer in, uh, in philosophy, which is a semantic or an epistemic answer. All right. So you end up with the following notion, which is a notion of a concept. If you've read my first book, don't disappoint me. I hope you've read it. Uh, uh, <laughs> so the first, uh, that's what I say in uh, chapter uh, one, roughly what I say. You know, a concept of X, the body of beliefs about X that is stored in long-term memory, and that is retrieved by default from memory in order to be used in the processes and like most, if not all, higher cognitive competencies when they result in judgments about X. It's a fully psychological notion about what a concept is. And I think it fits fairly well with the notion of mental files that Sally used in, in, in her talk. And I think it fits quite well with what Amy was talking about in the previous talk when she was talking about uh, login. I think, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure that they're identical, but, but there's surely a familiar resemblance uh, uh, right there. 
Now, some of you may have objection. Uh, how much time do I have already? When did I start? Oh, um, you've been going 15 minutes exactly. All right. So I'll go for the objection then. Uh, some, of, some of you. Some of you might think it's circular after all, like characterized concept by means of the of bodies. Some of you might say, well, all bodies made of cons, made up of concept. Isn't that a blatant circularity uh, right here? I don't think so. Uh, um, I think there are many things I could say, but one of them is that I think it's very natural to translate this talk of concepts being made of uh, belief, or concepts being construed by belief, in an inferential world framework, right? I mean, one way of thinking, what does it mean to say that the concept, for example, of dog is constituted by the belief that a dog are animal? It just means that the concept of, to have the concept of dog, you must be disposed to make the following inference. If X is a dog, so from the premise that X is a dog, then X is an animal. Nothing more, nothing less. And then, of course, nothing, nothing, nothing circular in this way of thinking about concept. So I think there's a very natural translation scheme from my way of talking about concept to this way of talking about concept. There's nothing circular there, so there's nothing circular in my way of thinking about Concept. What about concept individuation, you might ask? On my view, concepts are going to be in a constant flux. They're going to be constantly changing because what's accessed by default is not fixed. It's actually can be even vague. It's a vague property. So it's going to be changing over time depending on contingencies in your social environment, who you're talking to, what you see on TV, what you read on Twitter nowadays, and so on and so forth. What about concept individuation? Well, in general, I'm, I don't care very much about individuation. I think that's always a kind of a, uh, uh, a false debate. I think individuation is always interest relative, and, it, and anything can be individual in many, many different ways. Uh, so I don't really worry too much about individuation. But if you do worry, uh, we heard yesterday a talk by uh, Laura, which I think fits very well with many things I have to say uh, 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 here. And actually, I wrote that slide before listening to her talk. But it's the first part of, of, of the slide. Uh, you know, in a sense, uh, a jazz model is a way uh, of really uh, working out the details of uh, an idea I had under the shower, I suppose. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, you know, what two, why are two bodies of belief at and T and T star uh, the same concept? Well, maybe because they have the right historical relation. And being part of uh, a given uh, tradition is actually and, and, uh, is one way of fleshing out this quite incorrect idea. Uh, and we can extend the idea for uh, uh, between individual or between coincidence individuation. So no issue with concept individuation, I think. All right, so that's what I mean by concepts. Uh, as you can see, it's quite far from what philosophers mean by, by concept. But it does capture what psychologists mean by concept. Now, if you talk to psychologists, if psychologists is the more view, he or she is going to be nodding. Well, yes, yes, yes. That's obviously true, really what we mean by, 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 by concept. Anyway, uh, now, on my view, conceptual engineering just is changing these uh, bodies of belief, right? So what, uh, let me say a few more things about that. In the book, I, con I contrast conceptual explication and conceptual analysis. And the first one consists in changing. The second one consists in describing the concept constitutive belief. Why? Because this concept is, in some respect or other, deficient. And again, I mean, keep in mind here that by concept, I really mean what I describe in section one of this talk. Right? I really mean a specific psychological structure that is characterized in psychological terms. And that's uh, what's part of, so to speak, what is constitutive of that psychological structure is determined in psychological terms, not in semantic or uh, uh, epistemological terms. So what we want to do, according to me, if you are at least a specific form of conceptual engineer, is change the beliefs that we access by default when we think about X. So that's a picture, that's you. And then that's you after, right? You've changed the set of beliefs that is constitutive of the uh, concept of, of dog. Now, we've talked a little bit about the implementation question in this conference, I think rightly so. Um, um, you know, I, I think if it turns out we can't really do it, uh, I think it's nice to talk about things we can't do. <laughs> in some ways, it's kind of a waste of time. You know, if we really can't do it, why would we really even worry so much about it? Um, so in my mind, how would we change the belief is of course an empirical question. It can, can, can only be solved by looking at empirical psychology uh, and by psycholinguistic uh, 
But there's no reason to believe that it's undoable. There's actually quite a, quite a bit of uh, psychology about that very question. About how do some pieces of information become very salient in your mind and become prime or poised to be used in our interaction with the world? How do they drive our expectations about what kind members are going to be like, about samples of certain so There's quite a bit of psychology on, on that matter. We know that uh, monitoring, so uh, uh, metacognition, is part of the story. You can actually monitor on a regular basis how you deploy a world expressing a given concept. We know that repetition matters quite a bit. And some of the in most interesting trick in order to hack your own mind is to hack other people's minds. So it turns out that coordination matters quite a bit uh, uh, in uh, the structure of, of a concept. There's some nice psychology on the matter when people interact with one another, the interaction are actually con uh, leading them to converge on the same way of characterizing kinds of substances. And one idea is that, well, I'm going to influence you, and by influencing you, I influence myself. And we actually know quite how to influence other people. That's what advertisement. Uh, is, 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 all, is all about. Uh, so I, I, no, it's, it's only promotory uh, uh, notes, you know, uh, I think that's, it's an empirical question, more work needs to be done there, but there's really no reason to believe that there's a, a, an undoable project here to, uh, in a sense, teach oneself how to think. And of course it does not require any doxastic voluntarism, it does not require any commitment to the view that I can just decide what I believe. The, you know, changing my belief requires work and requires tricks to get me to believe uh, some specific things. Uh, uh, um, no commitment here to uh, what many people consider to be a, a mistaken view about uh, uh, beliefs. Now, I think at this point, uh, an objection, uh, it would be very natural. And the objection is, well, what's so important about concepts, right? So I can characterize concepts as a subset of our beliefs, right? Uh, which I identify uh, by means of the psychological property, namely being accessed by default, and one might say, well, is that just what you mean by concept? Why really focus on that subset? Why not just think that really the whole project is just change what you believe about the world, right? And in a sense, here, conceptual engineering would actually boil down to just uh, doxastic change, to just changing changing the beliefs you might have. There is no, there is no specific uh, uh, target here for theorizing about, um, uh, um, about change. In, in, and changing the mind, so to speak. Um, I think that's a good objection. Uh, but I think concepts, because of their nature, because of the fact that they are context independent, play an extremely important role in our cognitive life. They drive all changes, they drive many changes in other beliefs. They're always present in our mind when we think about their extension, about X, right? And because of for that reason, they're going to drive the type of additional information we can have about X. They're going to uh, 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 in a sense, a uh, uh, structure or information gathering from, from, from the world. So I think that's a context independent nature that makes them so important and such an important target for change when we think they are defective in uh, uh, some respect or, or other. That's, in a sense, why I think that concepts are, a, as I define them anyway, are a pro, uh, an important target for, for change. Now in the book, and I, I, and I think we've talked in some ways, but not under this term, uh, uh, about this distinction, actually I think it has popped up in, uh, uh, in, in various ways in this conference, I distinguish two types of, of explication. Uh, uh, Canopian explication and Gramscian explication. So Canopian explication fix epistemic deficiencies of concepts, by contrast, uh, Gramscian explication fix non-epistemic deficiencies. Of, of concept, you might you might as well. Why Gramsci? Well, I guess all of you know Gramsci. This Marxist, actually Bolshevik uh, uh, philosopher, who spent part of his life in jail under Mussolini. Um, Max, uh, uh, Gramsci, in his letters from prison, talked a lot about engineering the concept of ideology, and he he kept doesn't care about truth. The only thing he cares about making sure that the bad socialists, the ones who are not Bolshevik, really uh, get, get to define it. So it's really just a political project, nothing to do with epistemic, nothing to do with epistemic concepts. So that's, that's why I use uh, Gramscian uh, uh, explication. So what do I mean by epistemic deficiency? Epistem an epistemic deficiency is going to be a property of a concept that prevents the acquisition of true beliefs, or maybe justified beliefs, or maybe knowledge, or that leads to the formation of false beliefs, or to paradoxes, or to, in, or, or to uh, uh, contradictions. That's what I mean by epistemic deficiency. 
And if what you're trying to do by changing your concept is to remove these epistemic deficiencies, then you're engaged in Tanafian implication. Uh, what do I mean by non-epistemic deficiency? Well, some concepts are going to be intrinsically morally wrong. Remember, concepts are made up of beliefs. So having some beliefs may actually be morally wrong, but not the superiority of one race over another. So concepts in themselves can actually be uh, uh, intrinsically wrong. Concepts can also be wrong because of the consequences, the type of thought they need, they need to, the type of behavior they need to, and so on and so forth. Uh, so for political reasons or for moral reasons, for concern with justice and fairness, we may want to change the concept one has. Um, now, and I don't know exactly what I think about that matter, but, uh, and I've been wondering about that question for a few days, but I've wanted to put the slide because some of you have better ideas on the matter than I have. One might think, and I'm not sure whether I think that's the case, but that cannot be an explication address intrinsic deficiencies. So one might think there's something when a concept has an epistemic deficiency, it's intrinsically bad. Uh, there's something real, somehow the concept is not fulfilling its function, maybe. Uh, by contrast, Gramscian explication address extrinsic relational explication. Uh, you know, uh, a concept that, that includes racist belief may not be intrinsically bad, but it may be bad in relation to uh, moral facts, for example, or, or maybe your values or whatever. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, I'm just putting that here, I'm not really sure whether that, that is true. I'd be happy to get some feedback on that. Dave, how am I doing? Oh, um, you've been going for 26 minutes now. Oh my goodness. Minutes Good. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so let me just say a few things about uh, uh, both Kanapian explication and Gramscian explication. Uh, Kanap, of course, uh, 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 in the chapter one of Foundation of Probability in a few other places, but mostly in this chapter, introduces the notion of explication, which, which the basic idea is to replace full concept with explicitly formalized concepts because these concepts are obscure, imprecise, and vague. It gives us four criteria, and I've got a lot of things to say about them. Similarity in meaning, clarity, fruitfulness, and simplicity. Uh, one striking thing, if you read uh, this chapter, is that they come out of nowhere. <laughs> you just said, oh, that's a, that's a criteria that you should be using. Right? Uh, maybe. Uh, why? Uh, and how? Uh, it's utterly opaque and, uh, and utterly unjustified and utterly arbitrary. Uh, now, one, one might think there are actually reasons to choose, for example, a, sim uh, a similarity to original meaning in terms of conservativeness, right? Uh, you know, Bert's idea, right? Changes are risky, they lead to disaster. You know, our concepts are not perfect. But, but, but you know, uh, big changes are more likely to end up in complete disaster. Maybe that's one idea why uh, similarity in meaning matters. For, of course, for Kana, fruitfulness is very clear about that. It's a crucial property. Uh, now, I, in my mind, Canapian explication is broader, of course, than what Canap has in mind with explication. Uh, uh, the explication itself need not be formal. I talk about, just like David in the first talk, about blocks, distinction, and access and phenomenal consciousness. That's a great example of Canapian explication. So target need not be um, a, f a full concept, it be a scientific concept that needs to be improved. And the criteria need not be Canaps. And, and even if they are Canaps, they need not be sort the way Canaps think about it. They may be implemented in a very different way. And one way to implement them, so that's a great paper by one of my former students. That's not the only reason why it's here. Uh, but where, what we have here is a, uh, is a Canadian explication of the concept of explanatory power. I don't have the time to go in detail, but what I wanted to mention, the reason I mentioned this paper, is the way Jonah Shuba uh, tried to assess the value of his explication. He takes similarity very seriously. And the way he assesses similarity is by doing experimental work, comparing the deployment of the original context by lay people and the formal measure of explanatory power is developed in a context in which he can apply this formal measure of explanatory power. And what he shows is of the 10 or so a formal measure of explanatory power me from Gold and Popper and a bunch of other people, his measure is the one that's closest to lay judgment of explanatory power. So here that's a place where experimental work can actually put in the service of assessing the similarity between uh, 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 an explication, an explicant, and uh, the, exp the explicandum. Gramscian exp explication very quickly, concepts can be deficient for non-epistemic reason. It's very unclear, I think it's even more unclear how we're going to be assessing uh, 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 Gramscian uh, explicantia. Uh, similarity of meaning does not seem to be very important in this context. After all, one of the reasons is because we think the original concept is very bad, 
So we want to remove it. So being similar to the original concept does not seem to be extremely a powerful constraint. Clarity and other epistemic virtues. One might think that if you're reforming a concept of political reason, being clear is not really what is not really that important. Actually, being a bit opaque, being a bit imprecise, <laughs> similar, is it may actually be what you want because that may be actually expedient uh, for political reasons. So uh, Gramscian, Gramscian ex ex explication may actually move you away from valuing epistemic virtues. Um, and I, you know, I think we should really take that possibly very seriously. Fudging is good in politics. Uh, fruitfulness, well, it has to be redefined, not the way I kind of think about it. And simplicity, again, it's a bit unclear why simplicity would matter in this context. The broad point here is that we haven't thought very hard about the criteria for assessing explicantia. Uh, you know, there's some work in conceptual ethics that, of course, bears on this matter. But I think there's much more work to be done uh, on, on, uh, in, in, in the area. And the great example um, uh, uh, is, of course, Sally's work here on gender and race. Uh, do I have two minutes? Not really, but go ahead. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> so what I want to be talking about uh, very quickly is uh, say a few things uh, defending um, defending my uh, tech on uh, conceptual engineering and uh, trying to respond to uh, two things that uh, Herman has said in uh, his uh, manuscript. Um, and here's a quote from, uh, from Herman. It is essential to Canapian explication that the semantic value changes. For example, there can be no perceived well, you'll bear with me. Uh, without such change, it is essential to study Haslinger's similarity proposals for gender and rest terms that the intentions and probably also extension change. That is why she can describe her aim as that of getting rid of women. So, objections very obvious. My project has very little to do with uh, meaning. Actually, I spend quite a lot of time in the book. I'm saying, I don't want to say anything about that. I actually have no idea about this, uh, this, 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 this matters. And the uh, possible worry is that it might be interesting what I'm engaged in, but surely nothing to do with what philosophers interested in conceptual engineering have been all about. And we've seen in this conference, nearly all of the speakers and many of the questions are all talking in terms of meaning. They're thinking of conceptual engineering as a change in, in meaning. I don't. I don't think that's the right way to, to think about it. Now, so here's the first response out of the two responses I want to make. <laughs> Look, Herman, there are more things in heaven and earth, Herman that I dreamt in your philosophy. <laughs> um, all right, that's the first response, more precisely. Uh, many explicatory projects, including Canada, are actually, and indeed, put in semantic terms. I'm not going to, to deny that. That would be really uh, silly. But of course, we need not stick to Canada's own version of, of explication. And more important, I think, is uh, you know, that relates to uh, the point that was made earlier. Um, you know, uh, you know, one notion of meaning, if any, that we should be concerned with is, is, is controversial. Uh, as in fact, many similar projects, many projects which are in some respect similar to Canada's project, do not involve either a change in extension or a change in, in intention, right? Uh, this is, for example, the, uh, if you're really interested, I think that's an example that Rob gave uh, 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 yesterday. Uh, you know, if you're interested in improving the concept of disease, you don't want to change the extension of disease. You want to actually have a better characterization of what diseases are in order to promote better science. And it's actually, and I think that's true of most uh, explications in philosophy of science. They're not concerned with the change in extension. Uh, and I think uh, um, uh, that's also true. There may also be many cases that are, in some respects, similar to uh, CANAP's uh, project, but that don't require a change in, in intention. I think, for example, when we're concerned about queer, what we're mostly concerned is, a cha is a, um, changing the association, the connotations, not necessarily uh, the intention of, of this word, supposing I knew how to distinguish the two. Uh, more important, I think, is the second response. I think the first response is a bit concessive, yes, you're right, yes. Uh, but the second response is really the crucial one. I think we can really uh, get everything that matters without worrying about change in intention and change in extension. So uh, uh, Herman talked about precisification. Uh, now, and uh, the idea here is that uh, it requires a change the truth value uh, from being indeterminate to being either true or false. That's why we need to take into account extension to make sense of the concern with precisification. Uh, no, I think we can actually have a psychological, I think it's intentionally to uh, humiliate me. You put that word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, I think we can have a, psycho a psychological counterpart 
to this idea that we need a change in truth. But what we really need is we need to change the concept so that the dispositions people have are going to be changed. So instead of people just having a disposition to say true, false, indeterminate, they're going to have a disposition to say true, false. Right? Now we can remain neutral about whether or not there's been a change of truth value. What has been changed is people's disposition to make some assertions in the world of our context. So to understand the role of Canada's interest with this uh, idea of making things more precise, we need not go through the semantic detour. Uh, the same is true, I think we can say very similar things for uh, Sally's uh, project. What we want is that the concept after explication be such that if we happen to believe that there is no oppression anymore, then we would infer and then be disposed to assert that there are no women. Again, here we can make sense of uh, our interest in the claim that there are no women without really being that interested in uh, uh, the extension. What we really care about is changing people's disposition. Uh, I think Dave is getting very patient. Uh, changing people's disposition uh, to, to assert or deny uh, things. And, um, okay, I'll skip the second objection. If you're really interested, uh, ask me during the Q&A and I'll, 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 te I'll tell you about goes without saying, Haman is wrong and I'm right. Uh, uh, and it has anyway the same, the, same, the same spirit. The conclusion here is that, yeah, engineer. Engineer your concept, about which I mean, hack your mind, hack your cognitive structures, right? There's no need to go to uh, Snow Crash and to uh, the Necromancia, you know, if you knew a bit of uh, 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 science fiction. You can hack your mind right now and change the concepts you have, meaning a psychological structure that helps you govern your cognitive life and get more information about the world. All right, thank you. transforming a lay concept into a formal concept. Yeah, actually, it's very explicit, either in his response to uh, Scroson, or even in chapter one of uh, Probably, I don't exactly remember where, uh, that he actually is, is counting uh, non-formal characterization of concepts that diminishes the obscurity or imprecision or vagueness of the concept as form of explication. And indeed, in, if you read the chapter one of, of Foundations, you're going to see that some of these examples he gives, for example, is the development of the measurement of temperature. It just has some uh, incorrect history of science there. Uh, are actually uh, 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 non-formal characterizations. The first step are entirely non-formal. And he takes that to be uh, examples of uh, explication. So it's true that these paradigm paradigmatic examples are all formal, no question about that. But I don't think he himself actually uh, <coughs> Um, leave room for non formal explication. What is true, however, is that we only thought about the use of concept in a scientific context, right? so of full concept in a scientific context, how to improve the use of full concept. So that's, in that sense, that's a generalization where we're concerned about policies. Okay. So. Oh, okay, cool, thanks, hi. <coughs> um, I really enjoyed the talk. I was really, really struck by uh, 
um, how cavalier you were about your criteria for concept identity. So I remember you asked, um, what, uh, when, when did two sets of equal beliefs express the same concept? And you answered, eh, when they're sufficiently similar for some purposes, so it's too minimal and vague. Um, this sounds like it's going to be an objection, but actually I think it might be something kind of nice because one question people get their hands in a twist about when we're doing conceptual engineering is, oh, what are we doing? Changing the concept? Or are we trying to get rid of the old one and replace it with a new one that we misleadingly use the same wrapping <coughs> to express? Yeah, yeah. And if I'm understanding you rightly, it might be that it follows from your account that the answer to that question is, who cares? It doesn't matter. What we should do is try to change people's view what judgments the inferences that they yeah. thereby draw in a way that removes the deficiencies that you've described. Uh, so that sounds like a good answer. Am I right that's what I that's, it's, it's, that's exactly right. Oh, yeah. and I, I did ask, I mean, Sally, you know, very, very quickly yesterday, that was a point that I had in mind when I asked that question to Sally. Sally was really concerned with concept identity, and I don't think she needs to. Um, yeah. Eight. Oh, eight. Mine is kind of a follow-up to that, I guess. Um, um, so, so, yeah, on the concern with concept identity, so suppose I, I, I have the word bank and the concept of bank of the river um, and then I change all my uh, default beliefs that I have about the bank and I start thinking that it's a place where I go to get my money. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like clearly that's not conceptual engineering, that's not, we're not talking about the same concept that we were talking about before. So I was, I was kind of unclear on what part of the account secures that if all constitutive beliefs are good game for the engineer or all beliefs that we arise by default are good game uh, for change mm -hmm. uh, by the engineer, what secures identity? Um, of, of concepts? Yeah, of, of the content. So, I, as I said, it just doesn't matter. I mean, just just doesn't, it just literally doesn't matter. And the reason why your example is not a case of conceptual engineering has nothing to do with identity, right? It has to do with the fact that you took a word and just expressed a different set, a different set of, 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 of beliefs, right? Uh, because that's, the, the issue is, I mean, you, you may call that conceptual engineering if you want. I changed all my, I changed all, all, all the beliefs that I had by default. Sure, so what? Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure why you think that in itself is sufficient for not calling something a case of conceptual engineering. You might think, for example, I'm ju just in a sense of trying to see why that's not sufficient. You just spread that not in an extent, right now, but across time, 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 very, very long generations are involved. And so that the first generation, the last generation, so happens to have very different, very different beliefs. What's, as, as you by default, what's wrong to say that they have the same? Concepts. I mean, what's really at stake there? I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't exactly know. Would that be a case? Would that be less for case conceptual engineering? I'm, I'm not sure why that's relevant. Uh, yeah. Fourteen. Oh, that's me. It's another question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, you saw the delineation problem. Yeah. Uh, which leads to belief-like states without having a constitutive concept. You gave an answer, and then later on there were some questions about concept identity, and you said, "Oh, I kind of like this historical model." Where you're doing um, but I mean, if, as people have started to notice, right, you could have two people who are kind of historically linked in a certain way, but who have very different beliefs or belief-like states that are retrieved automatically from memory. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I don't, I, you're acting like, so your claim is that these belief-like states are constitutive of the concept. Mm -hmm. Well, something's, and at least as I understand the word, it's constitutive of the concept. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, nece it's a necessary feature of it. In fact, it's stronger that it's an essential feature of it. So it just seems to me that you can't have a theory of a constitutive feature that just floats free in your theory of identity. And in some of these comments, you say, well, I don't care about identity, it doesn't matter. But it seems like you're actually committed to a theory of identity, and so maybe roughly internal swan. And maybe you think that's not important or something like that. But I think you, have, you are committed to some things about content identity, insofar as you want to talk about constitutive features of anything. So uh, what about if I relativize uh, um, what's constitutive to a subject or to a cognitive agent at a time. So what's constitutive of your concept now is uh, a specific uh, set of beliefs that are accessed by default in long-term memory. Now, what makes uh, your concept at uh, T uh, star the same concept, if you wish, uh, not that I think very much matters uh, uh, for that question, is a specific historical continuity. What's wrong, what's wrong with that view? So I, I don't give you I don't give you um, uh, a set of essential properties for something to be the 
concept X. I just said something about my heart, right? I think there's nothing wrong with thinking that uh, my heart at, at, at now, at this time, is considered by a specific set of cells, right? But of course, the cells are going to constantly change and that kind of things. And what makes my heart now and my heart in two minutes the same organ is because it's historical continuity. What's, what's just wrong with that model for thinking about uh, as a relation with the concept and, and, and beliefs? Five. The word constitutive is playing in your theory. So I, I don't know what work it's doing, so I, I can't really evaluate it. Okay. Yeah. All right, five. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a question about your concept of a concept. Many philosophers think that there are indexical concepts, concepts you express by means of pronouns. And I have a hard time trying to understand what mm -hmm. the delineation problem would consist in, mm -hmm. given this specific family of concepts. Mm -hmm. For instance, when I use the first person, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to me that there is a set of beliefs that I accept by default. So that might be one first problem. The second problem is that uh, if you want to think that there are constitutive links between these concepts and other mental states, you want to do what? what? Uh, that there are constitutive links between uh, indexical concepts and other mental states, you might want to include things other than beliefs, like intention, for instance, given that many people think that they play a role in action guidance, or maybe perceptual states. So, so what do you think about uh, these family of concepts for yeah, that many people? Um, and what would uh, the delineation problem consist in mm -hmm. for these family of concepts? Uh, good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I want to say on top of my head. I and mean, the obvious thing to say uh, uh, for the present context is that uh, I'm not really concerned with uh, uh, indexical concepts. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in concepts of substances, concepts of kinds, concepts of events. Uh, that kind of, of concept for which the nation problem emerges, as if you said, if you see the issue the way I see it, a definition problem emerges. Now it may be that it does not emerge for other concepts, just in lexical concept. I have to think a little bit about that. You know, I don't want to commit myself to an answer at this point. And I think the obvious thing to say is just um, for, for my personal purposes, it doesn't matter a whole lot. We're not in the business of engineering I or now. Uh, as far as I know of this or that, uh, we're in the business of engineering woman of temperature or uh, uh, inertness or that kind of concept. So, you know, uh, even if it's true that the initial problem does not emerge for that kind of concept, it's, it's, it's uh, something I, I need to think a bit more about, but I don't think it's, it's, it's a, uh, a concept of mine. Uh, mine. Mike. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you what you think about the relation between concepts and the truth. Example of history of science. For many purposes, we want a way to characterize concept that does not answer, that does not use what's consistent of a concept at a given time, uh, 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 that does not use truth uh, as a way to characterize what's consistent of the concept at a given time. Historians of science do that all the time when they talk about the concept of temperature, for example, in the 17th century, or the concept of, 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 of whatever. So, yes, uh, it, it's a consequence. I'm perfectly happy to uh, put that in the in the view. Yeah. Um, great talk. So I'm trying to figure out what your view of concepts and conceptual engineering implies for concepts associated with theoretical terms like um, yeah. uh, like uh, physics, event horizon, or black holes. So it seems like uh, the structure of concepts you've outlined in terms of default beliefs, contextual ones, applies uh, to ordinary concepts and then places constraints on conceptual engineering, like default beliefs are super hard to revise, contextual material yeah. ones, not so much. Um, so then, take theoretical terms and concepts associated with them, the structure in terms of default versus non-default beliefs doesn't easily translate okay. there, because like, what's the default belief of what export for event horizon? And then, what are the constraints for conceptual engineering for those kinds of questions? Good question. I, I think I, I agree with you. So the notion of default 
it's not an accident that it's, it's, it's a distinction that comes from psychology yeah. and may not transfer obviously to concepts that belong to uh, uh, formal structures in, in, in science. Right? So um, I, yeah, it, it's a little bit unclear whether you want to say that a, a, a concept in particular physics, for example, of spin, uh -huh. is a set of uh, expectations that physicists have about, about uh, uh, about speed and how uh, you have speed, uh, what it means how you have speed for the and so on and so forth. So yes, I, I, I'm not exactly sure that it translates easily to that kind of, of context. That's, 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 that's a good point. Um, um, uh, Sorry, let me show you the view. Uh, I'm good. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, Great. Yes, I could. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, sorry. About um, the expression um, having a concept. Mm -hmm. As a concept, um, the problem arises especially in uh, your approach, uh, where it's quite clear that the lay person and the medical expert will be receiving very different, <coughs> retrieving automatically very different. Absolutely, yes. Let's say type two of diabetes or something yep. like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, now, if we insist that there's just this one relation having having a concept, then we've got to say, well, they they have different concepts. Sure, we might say, want to do that. Yeah. But this this is a problem for communication. I mean, there's some there's some pressure to go along with Tyler Birch, who uh, thinks of concepts as publicly available yeah. and shareable between an expert. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if you if you agree with that, then uh, that's some pressure to make a distinction between a relation between a, uh, a, a thinker and, and a concept. We need two different kinds of yeah. relations. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether you know uh, Paul Brandom's response to Jerry Fodor. I think it was PPR. Yeah, I think Brandom said, if you don't if you don't see how something could you know, you, you're bringing a new piece of furniture in, in a fat, bear with me for a sec. And, and so you, you, you don't see how it's going to fit. It's because you haven't moved the other pieces uh, uh, of furniture in your flat. So what's the moral here? I think my dog's right about that. What's the moral here is that if you, are, if you uh, address, if you use a kind of notion of concept, and have, you may have to change a few other notions uh, uh, at the same time. But you may have to change the way of thinking, for example, about successful communication. Uh, it may not be then that successful communication will, it, it will, it may not be, I think it, it, it won't be the case that successful communication requires sharing concepts. Right? Successful communication may be much more a matter of coordinating between different agents in specific, uh, in specific contexts. Right? Now, uh, if you think that successful coordination requires concept, then maybe that's an issue from my view, but again, I think you want to move many pieces at the same time, and you want to have an understanding of what Communication, successful communication and understanding involved uh, such that uh, uh, it's compatible with that of you I have. One idea is that successful communication just requires coordination and so that uh, I can, I can uh, transfer information in a given context. Hello. 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 Um, I think I have a question about how, what it takes for some set of beliefs that are all retrieved by default in some either specifiable set of contexts or a specifically general set of contexts to count as a concept. Um, because it, it didn't seem to me, and maybe I just missed this right at the beginning, um, but it didn't seem to me that you built in any in principle limitation on what, on what beliefs you could group in this way. So it seems you might have these internally incoherent concepts. Maybe that's okay on your view, especially yeah. since you're getting rid of analyticity and so forth. Yeah. But I, I think that's quite a substantive implication of, sure. of this way of conceiving concepts, as it were. And it has implications for whether we can uh, ever say of something that it is inconceivable and have that mean <laughs> that we should reject that view. Or whether anything yeah. being conceivable is even conceivable <laughs> on your view. So I just wanted to hear about whether there are <coughs> in principle limitations on what groupings of belief can count as a concept. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, there's no limitations. So indeed, I welcome uh, concepts without contradictions. Uh, and indeed, again, for some purposes, you exactly want to be in, in that position. So I don't know whether you, you know, Some, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly whether you, um, you've been following the recent work in uh, uh, history and philosophy of science about contradictory theories. It turns out that most scientific theories are actually contradictory. Well, no, this is not true. <laughs> Many <laughs> important. Uh, theories in <laughs> physics uh, 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 formulated in the 19th century are actually contradictory. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, nice books published on the matter uh, uh, recently. Now, if you say if, if that's true of the theory, I don't see why you know the way I'm thinking about concept that it wouldn't be true of a concept. That's why, after all, on my view, a concept is just a specific type of theory, right? Uh, a theory with specific psychological pro property. So I don't have no issue with uh, uh, building, uh, accepting. Um, a contradictory uh, belief as a constitutive of a concept at a given time. Now, the following question, which I think is very important, and I haven't thought very much about, so I remain uh, uh, agnostic about that. What are the consequences for things like considerability? Uh, uh, really good, really good question. Uh, maybe one way is to punt and just say, look, considerability has a relation with meaning, uh, and I'm not talking about meaning, uh, so I can just, I can just, in a sense. Um, um, bracket this question, and say, well, there's no relation for considerability. What I want then is the relation of meaning and how meaning is related to the type of things I'm interested in, if at all. Uh, that could be one, one answer. Or there could be a, a deeper connection. Maybe there is a deeper connection. Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't have a, an answer to give you. It, but of course, the answer has to be along the same line as the one I gave earlier. Right? A lot of things need to be moved uh, uh, for the view too. But I don't have anything to say about considerability. Let's talk about it more later. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice idea. I, I, yeah. 16. 16. Okay. Um, thanks. is actually part of the uh, determination basis of, 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 of meaning, meaning of dispositions to make assertions. So that's right. And I'm perfectly aware of that, and I'm happy with that. The only thing, I, I, I don't want to be committed to any specific view about meaning. And I think we can say interesting things about what <coughs> is at least on the, on the same point concept are about concept and also about conceptual engineering without committing oneself to a, a view about the nature of meaning and what determines meaning. So I agree, there's, there's an understanding of, there's a view of meaning that ties very closely what I'm talking, uh, 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 meaning with what I'm talking about. I just don't want to be committed to that view, I want to remain neutral on the matter. 15. Uh, so back to the publicity sort of worry you gave before. Uh, if you I wanted to bring the response to that the okay, but I'm wondering what stays the table for kind of high level concepts or complex concepts. So for us to have any sort of communication or even non communication in the universe, because mm -hmm. something like democracy, something has to have has to have some feature. It's the concept of democracy. Yeah. There's gotta be some stable features that are automatic and come to mind. Yeah. It's very hard for me to think that there's um, that there's going to be any stability for me across time, never mind across people here, in any way that's mm -hmm. the furniture response kind of easy. So um, maybe I'm just missing a whole load of literature here. But <coughs> Why do you care about stability? Why do you think it's important? Um, stability, so that I can think about the same thing? I, I I, I, as I said, you care, you, you, you care about the same thing. If you, want, if you really think it's an important question, I don't think it is. If you think it's an important question, one that, that's not interest relative, when I decide whether you are thinking about the same thing or not, well, how do you do that? Maybe historical continuity between your thought now and the thought then are what's needed. For a super high-level number, 3,264,000 or whatever, you know, there's, so there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a generative system that explains why somehow that number is connected to other numbers. So there's indeed a continuity, right, psychological continuity right there, not is that between this, con this concept and, um, um, I mean, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, number one. Oh, that's me. Okay, so hack your mind. Yes. I want to start now. How do I do it? <laughs> Could you give us a little bit of um, a brief background uh, just to expand a little bit where you said there's a psychological research about yeah. how to change our kinds of I'm going to hear more about that. So, uh, the psychological research is not so much about how you hack your mind. It's about what's constitutive of what, what makes something access by default. Uh, and, and so the idea is that, so we, we actually have some information about that. Repetition is extremely central. So, uh, you know, the more you think about something in one way, the more, the more likely is that independent then across contexts, you're going to start thinking about, about the same thing, about that thing in the same way. Uh, that's one of the determinants. Uh, uh, now we can intervene on that kind of, of things. I think uh, the use of words is extremely important. So you can verbalize uh, things and control the way you use words, uh, so which is why I think definitions are extremely important uh, uh, in a scientific context. Now, I don't think you can properly define things, and that's often an illusion, but definitions are important for cognitive purpose because they give us a specific way of, 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 of using a word that have, have, have consequences for the way we tend to think. Now they give us a, a handle on which we can uh, 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 metacognitively focus on. Right? So if I agree that innateness is going to be blah, 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 despite the fact that spontaneously yes, I think about innateness in a very different manner, mm -hmm. the fact that I have got these linguistic definitions in the scientific context, I can always remind myself, oh, by innateness and this and this and this, and so this, I mean, what influence I'm willing to draw when I say that something is innate, for example. Uh, so the role of words, I think, mean, actually uh, examined quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. In, in, in this context. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean very much psychological research, but exactly hacking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's a good start. I think we're going to ask that return. Once the money I have is, is dried up. Uh, yeah. that's, that's another project. <laughs> Two. Oh. Um, so there's no such thing as the concept dog, there's my concept dog, yeah. there's your concept dog, that's right. there's Dave's concept dog. Um, now, I have no idea what Dave's concept dog is, or whether it's defective in any way, it would be kind of expensive and <coughs> right now, they would never let me. So why doesn't your proposal just turn <laughs> central engineering into a personal project to solve the group? Yeah, I, 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 I actually think that, uh, so that's the way I actually describe it as a group. Oh, I see. Ah, Ooh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so much of my devastation. <laughs> On the other hand, of course, we are, called, we are coordinated, right? So we know that when I interact, when I talk about dog, you, I'm able to convey information to you, right? So when I say look at the dog, you're not looking at the chair. So very likely you have, you know, what comes to your mind when I use the word dog is not unrelated to what comes to my mind when I use the word dog. So because of, of, of coordination of that kind, but perfect, because there's reasonable expectation, there's a great overlap sense of different ways of thinking about that. So, our incentive, so that's in a sense give you some ideas about what's in your head. 17. I'm going to pass. 10. Yeah. So you have this mistake of this conjecture about Carnapian. I don't remember exactly what it was, but Carnapian bad is a good what comes from the intrinsic matter. Okay. Yeah. And I was thinking, I think there are different ways of understanding okay, good. that conjecture, but on one way of understanding that, which I was clearly false. Okay. Great. I was thinking that sort of a concept that's sort of useful for a certain kind of yeah. creature, search for truth is, is um, less useful for another kind of creature, so a concept that's too, so, so complex that we would do really badly using that, right. it would be such that a more higher creature could use that yeah. successfully. Yeah. Right. I, I, I mean, that, that, that's the type of considerations I had, I had in mind, where I was not really sure whether that was actually a true, so yeah. Uh, you have to, is there a reading way to, to, to conjecture comes out to be better? <laughs> no, um, I was I wasn't sure. I was I mean I mean this, um, I mean this 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 relied on treating the kind of Carnapian goodness of any kind of broadly consequentialist yeah. matter. And I was thinking maybe there's a way of understanding it so that it has yeah. more to do with sort of vision. Because in this in this sense, I mean maybe the naive incoherent concept of truth is more epistemic. Yeah. It's epistemically better than a much more sort of complex yeah. one. Whereas you may think that there's some sort of some more intrinsic notion where there's yeah. sort of sort of incoherent, naive concept of truth um, yeah. um, I mean, you, you may want to use a distinction for them to us all consider, right? So the concept, every concept with um, an epistemic deficiency is bad in this respect, even so all considered 
it's actually better to have it. Right? So they don't want to have it in mind. I, I skipped the slide. So I think in this context, it's really important. So we feel the first tend to think that precision matters a whole lot. We tend to think that a police needs tends to be a bad thing. We want to be speaking you know, roughly uh, because it's with one another. We tend to think that obscurity is a bad thing. We want to know what the commitments are when we are committed to a given concept. If you look at the history of science, it's often not the case, actually. Very imprecise and polysemous uh, words have actually been extremely useful in some, some of these other sense. And the work on the concept of gene, which actually is a great example for conceptual engineering, does suggest that vagueness, imprecision, and so on and so forth, may everything considered be actually systemically good to have. That somebody will be saying that in themselves, they're, they're, they're bad, right? So they may be good in fact, but they're bad in themselves. Right? Okay, with apologies to the 19, 12, 6, 13, and 18, <laughs> we have to move on. Okay.